right over there. You know, he's off camera. You guys ready to worship the Lord this morning? Look at that. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of the servant Moses, righteousness being so. And though these 
Gus will come back and you'll be done with me. No, we're, we're not done with you, trust me. Oh, that's true. Oh, did he? I can't All right. read that. Can read it. No, you can read it. No, you can. Okay. I can't read Gary, it. the blessing, this is from Gus. Gary, the blessings of our Lord are upon you and the refreshment of Jesus the Christ is yours now and forever. I am thankful our Lord for you. I am thanking the Lord for you this morning. Please greet the band of brothers for me. Lord willing, I should be back around 6th of June. Sing to the Lord. Well, all right. Sing to the So you're, uh, okay, very good. You're preaching next week. Sing to the, so sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Thank you, Gus. Amen. 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 There you so go. the 6th of June, that's like Thursday. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
Yeah. When, when do we meet? Wednesdays. Wednesday. Yeah. All right. Thursday, well. Saturday, Wednesdays. Hey, um, so good morning, guys. Uh, what a joy it is to, to be able to gather again um, as, the, uh, as the sons, as the soldiers of our risen Lord. And, Amen. Uh, I'm seeing some new faces actually in here this morning, and that's, uh, that's fantastic as well. Um, Jim Romig, where are you? Yeah, come here re real quick. Come on up here real quick. Uh, if you guys don't know Jim, he is, uh, he's heading out of town. He is honoring his mother right. um, by moving to Los Banos, where she is uh, 93 years old. Is that right? And so he's leaving us. You've been here for several years. Uh, he's a great man of God. And, uh, but he's going he's gonna to move over there, and he's going to honor his mother by taking care of her. And um, so w before we go to Scripture, you're going to stay right here, and I'm going to pray for you. Okay? Uh, because you still have a lot of work to do. Don't you? Yes. Um, and then Warren? Yes, we have a, a His Healing Hands dinner, um, June 22nd from 6 to 9. First of all, if anybody wants to come to it, it's free to come. And I have a sign-up sheet. All you have to do is sign up. And That's say, a good deal, by yeah, the way. So it's a very good Jewish deal. And anytime... <laughs> But, but as all Jewish deals, I'll tell you, it's not really free. Yeah, because there's a hook. There's always a hook. Who's emceeing that night? Uh, I don't know. Mike, who's emceeing? Are you? Maybe. I... We don't know. <laughs> We're well organized. We're well organized. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the deal is if you, want to, if you want to support a table, you can pay for a table, which is uh, $450 for a table. Or if you want to host a table, we have tables that other people have paid for, and you can host the table. In other words, you can get eight other people, and it's free to all of them. We have a couple more tables to be uh, supported. If you want to support a table, you can. If you want to just host a table, invite people, you can. And if you want to just come yourself, it's free to the people who want to come. Who's, who's been to one of the His Healing Hands in it? Yes. Aren't they phenomenal? Yeah. Uh, it's going to be out at the winery. Right, oh, we really? have a comedian. We, we've had comedians, but... Is he a Jewish we comedian? Or? <laughs> Haven't you been listening to my jokes? Hey, did you hear the one about the rabbi and the Catholic and the Baptist priest? <laughs> Uh, we have Nazareth coming. He's a Christian comedian. If you haven't heard of him, he's a great man of God. And uh, he tells an incredible story. He, he is not originally from here. He's uh, from the Middle East. So, uh, and uh, it, how he met his wife is quite a great story. What side is he on? Uh, well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be a great time. And if you've, if you've never been, come on down. And it's like I said, it's free. And we'd love to have you be a part of it. But we do need to know, so we need to know how many dinners that we need to make. Okay? Right. And I have a sign-up sheet, so if you'd like to sign up, uh, you just have to tell us what you want to eat. Try tip chicken or portobello mushrooms or meatball or, 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 or uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. Or, matzo is, uh, or matzo balls. Is uh, Open Range catering again? Yes, yes. Open, open Range is Greg yes. Peterson's yes. Uh, company. Yes. They yes, do, they do a really good job. So please come, and it'll be a great night. Uh, we praise Silent God. Silent auction. Silent auction, and I believe Worku will be there, who you had met from Ethiopia, and so we'll we'll have a great night. And it's and really it's a great ministry. And right now, you know, they're in the Philippines, and yeah. I hear they're doing very very well. Many people are coming to the Lord. I the policemen. A, I got a text from Dwayne, who says that he and Randy were in a coffee shop over there, just kind of relaxing a little bit, trying to catch their breath before they got going um, with the week. And uh, they met three uh, Mormon missionaries there. And Dwayne said, yeah. <laughs> if you guys don't know Randy Bossom, Randy has an extreme gift of apologetics. Yes. And he, 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 just, he just lays it right out. And I, I have no doubt that they received the gospel message that day. So uh, uh, Dwayne's text made it sound like, yeah, they got beat up a little bit, but, you know, it's for the glory of God. So uh, everything's all good. So continue, yes. to, continue to pray for them because they are having, um, you know, medical clinics and they're having what they call festivals where, you know, we used to call them crusades, but they don't do that anymore. And uh, they're, having th they're going to have thousands of people are going to hear the word of God. Wow. So it's, keep praying it's for phenomenal. them. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. All right, man. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pray a blessing over us this morning, and, and Jim, as we uh, as we get going into scripture. So you have scripture around your table, 
and uh, we're going to try to give you a little bit more time this morning. And uh, um, let's no, just we're go not. Before alert. No, we're not. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Father yeah. God, Lord, we love you so much, and uh, it's such a joy to be able to gather with your sons, just to uh, just to bless your holy name, Father. Uh, and this morning, as we stand laying hands on Jim, would you bless this man? He's been such a gift to the body, Amen. such a gift to us. He's such a dear friend. But Lord, he knows what your word says about honoring his mother, and his mother needs help. So, Father, he's pulling up stakes here in Paso Robles, and he's, he's moving to honor his mother and to take care of her in these last days. So a blessing on him, Father. I just, I just ask that you, uh, you anoint him with yourself, Father, that you overwhelm him with you, that you uh, uh, just give him comfort and ease his pain as he continues to heal. Lord, and above all, Father, I just ask that you, uh, you draw him closer to you, Father, and, and just keep him from evil. And just keep him safe, Father, until we meet again. A blessing on Jim Romick that can only come from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, man. God bless you guys. Okay. Uh, I hope you have your verses in front of you. We try to give them out. If not, they're up there. You know, I realized for the last couple of weeks we've been talking about uh, in Romans 9, 10, and 11 about how God has not abandoned the Jews, how the Jews have not been replaced, and how the, uh, the Jews are still in God's plan. Uh, Romans 11.25 says that God will uh, pay attention to the Jews after the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And, but really, Romans 9, 10, and 11 were more about defending God. Paul is defending God because people were saying, well, Paul, how could you not be ashamed of the gospel? You're saying it's a new gospel. It's a gospel by grace. You're throwing out the law. Every, oh, for 2,000 years, it's always been the law. What are you doing? And Paul defends God by saying that God is a covenant-keeping God. God is not a liar. God keeps his covenants. He keeps his promises. He does what he says he's going to do. I realize we have not discussed what a covenant is. So today I want to talk about a covenant. If God is a covenant-keeping God, what are the covenants? Are they in effect now? And how does it affect your life? So uh, let's uh, have a word of prayer and then you guys can read those verses. Heavenly Father and our God, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word has been kept alive by the Jews all these years. Thank you that we have your word in its entirety. Thank you that we can read it in a free country, that we're, we're free to open up the word of God and read it. May we be men of the word. I thank you for what you'll teach us today. May we take it and apply it to our lives so people will see Jesus in us. We will reflect his glory to other people. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Okay, couple of more minutes. ready you guys are my the judge if you're ready they're ready <clears throat> okay if you want to get some more coffee this is the time to do it or a donut Scott asked me if I had any jokes and I forgot to think about any Jewish jokes all right guys you rem uh, I probably told you this joke before, but it's an old standby. You know the Jewish dilemma, right? Free ham. Free ham. The Jewish dilemma. Free ham. Okay. Now, we speak about making a covenant, right? An agreement. But the Bible speaks of cutting a covenant. That's what the Bible talks about, cutting a covenant, because blood is involved. The essence of life had to seal the covenant. God chose to seal the deal with a covenant of blood. Now, we talk about four major covenants. I would add another one. I would talk about the Abrahamic covenant as well, which is really a promise, uh, not necessarily a covenant. But these four major covenants with God and man, besides this creation of man, are always with Israel. Each covenant is made with a different famous Bible character, all Jews, Abraham, Moses, David, of course, Jesus, the Son of God, all with the nation of Israel. They uh, directly affect the life of every man on this planet. They are in place today, some of them, whether man acknowledges them or not. If they're embraced, they bring joy, peace, blessings, eternal life with God. If they're rejected, they bring sadness, turmoil, cursing, and eternal separation from God. The first three are during the Old Testament. And by the way, testament is another word for covenant. And the fourth is instituted by, by Jesus, the Son of God. Matthew 26, 28 says, For this is my blood of the new covenant. We all find our history and our eternal destiny around these covenants. They're very important. The word covenant comes from the Hebrew word berit, berit which is, means to cut or to divide. It was a solemn ceremony around the death of an animal. The idea is the covenant, if the covenant isn't obeyed, what happened to the animal, which was cut in two, would happen to you. Death. That's, that's what that may, meant. That's why the Bible speaks of cutting a covenant. Because blood, the very essence of life, had to be spilled. That's why Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant. These covenants bind God to what he has promised. And that's why in Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul was defending God as a covenant-keeping God. Now, the Adamic covenant, Genesis 1.26 says, and you know these verses, then God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness so that it may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over the livestock of all the animal, wild animals, over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We have some of the attributes of God. We have attributes like love, like forgiveness, like grace, like mercy. And those attributes that were given to us, we can give to others. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the, of the sky, over everything, living creatures that move on the ground. Then in Genesis 2.16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat it, you will surely die. The devil said, If you eat it, you'll know good and good between good and evil and you will not die it was exactly wrong they spiritually died instantly and they knew the difference between good and evil according to the devil according to themselves according to man not according to god it was exactly the opposite of what god had told them let's talk about the abrahamic covenant you just read it genesis 15 1 to 19 
It says, after this, after what? That's the battle that Abraham had to rescue his nephew Lot. The word of the Lord came to Abraham. Now, this verse is good enough for me. This is, the, to me, I, I just get this verse, that's it. It says, do not be afraid. I like it. I am your shield and your great reward. I don't have to be afraid. God's going to protect me, and he's my reward. What else do I need in life? This is it. This is the whole deal. But Abraham said, I mean, Abraham is Jewish. This guy's bold. He's talking to God. God just tells him the greatest thing. He says, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childish, childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? He's saying, you're going to give me all these things, but I have, no, I have no heir. I can't pass it on to anybody. What good is it? He's talking to God. And Abraham said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. And the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own, from your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord. This is such an important verse. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. The word believed here in the Hebrew, I don't know if you realize, is the word amen. That's what it is in the Hebrew. Abraham believed God. He said, amen, God. What a testimony of faith. What a testimony of faith. He says, I agree. That's what he's saying. Amen. I agree. Every time you say amen, you're saying I agree with what was just said. Every time. Abraham believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord. I mean, he doesn't give up this guy. How can I know? Here's the promise. He wants to know. He wants a guarantee. How can I know that I will gain possession of it? Wow. He wanted a promise. He wanted a covenant. So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer and a goat and a ram each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all these things to him, cut them in two, arranged them in halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. I kind of did a study on this. Why didn't he cut the birds in half? And I never got a good answer. I don't know if anybody has a good answer to that. But some commentators say, well, they're too, too small to cut in half. Some say, well, you don't have to cut in half because there were two of them. Okay, I'm not sure. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him because he, he was going to hear some bad news. Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years, look, listen to this prophecy, every one of these things has come true. This is, one of the, this is one of the biggest proofs that the Bible is the word of God, fulfilled prophecy. God says it and it happens. And if he said it and it happened before, when he says prophecy now that it hasn't happened yet, why wouldn't you believe? Because he said it before and it's happened. Abraham, so know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country you know that in egypt not their own and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there but i will punish the nation they serve as slaves you know about the plagues and after afterwards they would come out with great possessions and they did you however will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried in a good old age in the fourth generation your descendants will come back here for the sin of the amorites has not yet reached its full measure in other words God was giving these Amorites or the, or the heathen or the Canaanites a chance. And for 400 years, it took for them to fill up the cup of wrath. He's given us a chance now, too. When is the cup of wrath going to be full? When is that going to happen? Tomorrow, tonight, a thousand years from now? I don't know. But when it happens, God's going to act. Verse 17, when the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch, and this is God's glory, appeared and passed between the pieces. Abraham was not involved in this, only God. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, to your descendants, I give the land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Canaanites, Canaanites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Parasites, Perizzites, Rephaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, Jebusites. They're all gone. You don't have any of those people now, but you still got the Jew. I'm standing for, I'm standing. I'm standing. I'm standing in front of you. This was very irregular because both parties should have passed through the parts of the slain animal, but it was only God. God alone was responsible for this covenant cut in blood. Cut in blood. To the nation of Israel, 
It says, of a seed that would come through the na that nation, the Christ, and the blessing to all mankind. That blessing would be for all who, like Abraham, believed in God's word and the provision for sin through Jesus Christ. Amen. I believe, right? So neither Abraham nor us had to do anything to keep the covenant. It's all on God. He alone walked through the slain animals. Later, Abraham was tested by God on Mount Moriah, and he proved his faith in God. God was so pleased with Abraham that he took an oath. God took an oath in Genesis 22, and he said, I will swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. And we know that Jesus blesses all. So God not only made a unilateral covenant, a promise, but he swore by himself because the book of Hebrews says he had to swear by himself as there was no one greater than himself and an oath must be made to someone greater than yourself. So who's God going to swear an oath to? He had to swear it to himself. He made a promise and an oath, and God cannot lie. Hebrews 6.16 says, And Jesus is a promised seed of blessing, and that is why John in 4.22 says, Salvation is of the Jews. I told you we're going to have a, a Greek festival at my winery on the, on the 15th. I thought I'd make a banner and say to the Jew first and also to the Greeks, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know if they'd appreciate that, but I was thinking about it. Oh, yeah, right, absolutely. I've done that before. <laughs> All good things come from above because of the Abrahamic covenant. Look at John 3.16. Everybody knows John 3.16. In lieu of the Abrahamic covenant, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and I add, through the loins of Abraham, that whoever believes in him, and I add, like the faith of Father Abraham, shall not perish but have eternal life, the divine blessing through the Abrahamic covenant covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is still in effect. It's still in effect. Now the Mosaic covenant, 400 years after that, of the, after the Abrahamic covenant, God did not forget his covenant with the seed of Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant was made with a man. The Mosaic covenant was made with a nation, Israel. And you know the summary of the Mosaic covenant. It's called the Ten Commandments, right? I was going to read them, but you know them all. I'll have, I, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall no other God before me. shouldn't have any graven images. Um, remember the Sabbath. Honor your father and mother, as, as Jim is, is doing, so that you may have long life in the land uh, the Lord your God is giving you. You're going to have a long life, Jim. There you go. You shall not murder. You shouldn't commit adultery. You shouldn't steal. You shouldn't give false testimony. You shouldn't covet. Now, you know the story of Jacob and his 12 sons and how they became slaves in Egypt. As the new Pharaoh, it says, knew not Joseph. They, they were given the Mosaic Covenant or simply the law. The Mosaic Covenant is simply the law. And what was it given for? To bring civil, moral, and ceremonial or religious stability to this rabble of a people. That's why it was given. The people agreed to the covenant. The covenant contained an identification of God, a historical reference of what God had done, and the principles that govern their relationship between God and man and man and man. The covenant also had a list of blessings and cursing, cur curses and an oath that needed to be, to be affirmed. The Mosaic covenant, like the Abrahamic covenant, was confirmed in blood. Exodus 24, 8, Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So some principles of the Mosaic covenant. It was bilateral. It was conditional on obedience of the people, blessings and curses. It was a performance code. It did not replace or modify the Abrahamic covenant. The promise was given to Abraham of three things, land, the seed, and blessing. The law, as I told you last week, was not a way to life, but a way of life, a moral code, a civil code, a religious code. 
No one gained heaven by the law, but by faith, as it is attributed to Abraham as righteousness. Same with us. And finally, the law was good, but the people could not keep it perfectly. Not even close. The Old Testament acknowledges that they wouldn't be able to keep it, because in Jeremiah 31, 31, it says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. They had to have a new covenant. The new covenant will replace the Mosaic covenant. And with new hearts, new, nature, new nature, natures, the people will be able to supernaturally obey God. How can they supernaturally obey God? You have the Holy Spirit in you. So you couldn't do it in the Old Covenant. You couldn't do it in the Mosaic Covenant, in the Law. But you can do it because now you have the Holy Spirit in you. Now we come to the Davidic Covenant. So we had really the Adamic Covenant, which is really one. And we had the uh, Abrahamic Covenant, we have the Mosaic Covenant. Now we have the Davidic Covenant. 2 Samuel 7, 12. You read that. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my na name. He's talking about Solomon. And I will establish the throne of his ki kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. Down to verse 16, it says, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So David comes along and says, look at my beautiful house. God doesn't have a beautiful temple. You know, he's in a, he's in a tent. I'm going to build him a temple. And God says, no, through the prophet Nathan. He says, no, you're a man of blood. You're a man of war. That's fine. That's what I made you. You're a man of war. But a man of peace must build my house. And that was Solomon. But then he says, almost like an aside, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. King David had consolidated the 12 tribes of Israel. He made the capital Jerusalem. He brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. He wanted to build his temple to Jehovah. And God says, no, you're a man of war. But, but your line will be eternal and king, kingly and forever a dynasty. Again, 2 Samuel 7, 16, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. David, through Solomon's throne, would be established forever. Psalm 89, 3 to 4 says, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. We know the history after the death of Solomon, Israel was divided in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The Bible describes these times as the times of the Gentiles, which is still in place. The times of the Gentiles. So no Jewish king in the last 2,600 years of the tribe of Judah has reigned over Israel. They have, you know, they have always had conquerors, except for maybe the Maccabees. But since 1948, the Jews are back in the land. And we know Jerusalem was just made the capital again. It seems like things are lining up, doesn't it, in our lifetime. However, the nation of Israel has remained in unbelief, and the rulers are neither divinely appointed and they're, or in the Davidic line. They're not. From a human perspective, the world's out of control. It's a mess. But from the divine perspective, God is preparing for Jesus' second coming when the Messiah in the line of David will sit on the throne of Israel in Jerusalem to rule the world. And there will never be peace in the Middle East until that happens, until the Messiah in the line of David sits on the throne in Jerusalem and rules the world. Genesis 49.10, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nation shall be his, then the times of the Gentiles will end. It's just like Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Remember his dream in Daniel 2? He says, Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. Remember, it had a head of gold and a chest of and arms of bronze and its belly and thighs of bronze and its legs of iron, its feet partially of iron and partially of clay, while you were watching a rock was cut out, but not of human hands. Not of human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff in the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock 
that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Then it says in Revelation 5.5, 5, when they were looking for someone to open the seals, then one of the elders said to me, do not weep, see, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scrolls and its seven seals. Then in Revelation 22.16, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. See, it all comes together. Now we come to the new covenant, Luke 22.14. When the hour came, Jesus and the apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover before I suffer. What he really meant was before I become the Passover. He became the Passover. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it fill, finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the what? The new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. It's always in blood, all these covenants. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, so that we get his righteousness. I told you before, that is the best deal that I ever heard. And I like deals, there's no deal better than that. He gets my sin, I get his righteousness. Through Jesus' sacrificial, vicarious, substitutionary death, the sons and daughter of, daughters of God will be redeemed. For 1,500 years, from Moses to Jesus, the Jewish people killed and ate the Passover lamb as a memorial for the first Passover. Now Jesus would become the Passover lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Now the unleavened bread that he broke represents sinlessness. That becomes a replacement for, sin, for the sinless lamb in our memorial. Take this bread which is broken for you in remembrance of me. So you see that the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, all given by God to the Jews, culminates in the new covenant of Jesus. The new covenant was given to Israel. Jeremiah 31, 31, it says it. But now the blood was shed for all who accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. So what have we learned from the four covenants? The law covenant, the Mosaic covenant, sacrifices were prov provisional and reoccurring. Under the new covenant, Jesus' sacrifice was total, sufficient, eternal. Under the law, the sacrifices were to cover sin. Jesus' sacrifice takes away sin, paid the price for sin. The new covenant totally replaces the law covenant, the Mosaic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant are still in effect and are unconditional. The Messiah will still come from Abraham's loins through the line of David. The idea that the old covenant is only for the Jews, I believe, has robbed the church of biblical truths and the biblical balance. Jesus is the seed from the loins of Abraham and in the line of King David who brings blessings to all men and women of faith. Believers are no longer under the law. Jesus, we read, remember last week, is the culmination, the telos of the law. It is finished. The new covenant has a better priesthood, a better sacrifice, a better and better promises. It provides perfect righteousness and now we who believe are righteous, holy men of God without condemnation in Jesus Christ. I, had a, I got it. I said it. Condemnation. It's for you, Gus. It's true. <laughs> to understand human history, we must understand the covenants of God. So I hope this gives you a little basis of, of not only the covenants, but the continuity of it all. It's amazing. I, I've told you several times, the Old Testament and the New Testament are one book. God's plan has never been thwarted. God's plan has never come off the tracks. God's plan has always done exactly what God has planned. To us, it seems chaotic at times. Never to God. Never. Okay, let's have the guys come up and we'll sing praises to the Lord.
If you want to, if you want to go to the dinner, please sign up here. I'll put it down here. I'll leave it here. God said, don't be afraid. I'm your shield. I'm your great reward. So let's go out there and get them. All right. 
gather around some men together and pray. Pray that today would be the day that they'd be able to present to the Lord to somebody in this area this very day. Thank you, man.